Okay, well, thank you for coming. I'm Vern Bissell. I um, am a graduate of Pepperdine University. Actually, I'm a graduate of George Pepperdine College when it was in South Central LA at 79th and Vermont 50 years ago. And uh, things have changed a little bit. Uh, they went up on the hill in Malibu after I left town. But um, I've always had an interest in science. I've done science in my life, a lot of different kinds of science. I have an undergraduate degree in physics, undergraduate degree in mathematics, a uh, graduate degree, a master's and PhD in water resources engineering with a basic a PhD minor in statistics and probability from math department, University of Maryland. And I've done a lot of uh, work in science. Uh, when I uh, was in the East Coast working for the National Weather Service headquarters, my job was a chief scientist for measuring snow by flying airplanes over the the plains of the upper Midwest United States measuring gamma radiation from the soil. As there's more snow on the ground, it attenuates the radiation that gives you a measurement of how much water is there. So when the snow melts, you know how much water is going to go in the river, how high will the river go, and the weather service is supposed to warn people if the river is going to get too high. So that was a part of my job before I finally succumbed to the temptation, the desire to get back to the, to the left coast, which we officially know as the west coast. And... Uh, um, because I just didn't like the humidity in the east. So I, I love our dry weather out in the west. So we came back with my wife, and we were just here in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. And the night before our wedding anniversary, we went to a Dodgers game. Any Dodger fans? So anyway, i uh, got some history here. But in the last 20 years, um, actually 30... 35 years ago, I started going to meet international students at the local university in Portland, Portland State University. And in 1981, most of those were Iranian students uh, because of the uh, overthrow of the Shah of Iran uh, and so on. A lot of uh, African students, Korean students, Japanese students, but um, increasingly over the next several uh, years, more and more students were coming from mainland China. And I met many of those. Uh, got to meet the guy who was cutting the hair for all the rest of the guys because all the students at Ch from China at that time couldn't afford a haircut unless it was done by a friend. And uh, so I've been meeting friends from China, visiting scholars and so on since that time. I visited China a number of, probably about 15 times. Been involved with getting books published in Chinese. For example, The Soul of Science uh, is a book, book written by Nancy Piercy uh, and, and Thaxton. Uh, and I've worked on our project, worked on getting that publication uh, well, translated into Chinese, published and distributed in China uh, by a Chinese publisher in, in, uh, in, in Chengdu, and other books in China as well. So God just kind of led me that way, so here I am. But because I also have interest in apologetics, uh, there's a real need for people to know that in China today probably is some of the greatest apologetic evidence, extra-biblical evidence, in support of the Bible. What do I mean by extra-biblical? It's not like extra homework. It's Extra means outside of the Bible. It means two different witnesses to say the same thing. Is this reliable? Is this believable? And so the topic today is the China Genesis witness. And maybe in the next uh, uh, not-so-long-from-now time, uh, hopefully I'll be trying to find groups who will want to go and go to the same places that I visited about two months ago. Came back from China March 15th, so it's been uh, about seven weeks now. Uh, visited a lot of places that I went to look for specific things, dealing with creation apologetics. And so a lot of what I will show now, some of the pictures and so on will be from uh, only a couple of months ago in China. So um, I'll go back up to this. This is one of the main points that I want to focus on. Again, the same subject as the first talk earlier this morning, and that is, is the book of Genesis reliable? Is it truthful? Are there other things that tell the same story? Because, uh, let's see, if, if you grew up as a single child, your life is too easy. Because you can tell your parents anything, you know, and they have to believe it. But if you have a brother or sister and you get in a fight, you know, the mom and dad are going to say, okay, you to this corner, you to this corner, 
Go to one court, what happened? Come to the other side, what happened? So, you know, you better tell it straight or mom and dad's gonna, they're gonna find out, right? Because you have independent evidence. You get two different stories from different sources. You compare to say, are they saying the same thing or not? And that's what we're really talking about. Many people who don't want to believe the Bible record of Genesis, they'll treat it like the one child in the corner and you, you, you can't get it in. They say, oh, there's the Bible. I don't think that's telling the truth. But there's a lot of independent evidence and there's a, an abundance of that in China. So uh, let me just talk about this picture first because I want to make sure I get some of the, the main information here at the front in case I don't get to it at the back, okay? So uh, I'm starting with this, and it's pretty close to where we'll finish, too. Modernists, starting here, what do I mean by a modernist? It sounds okay, but in my context, it means a Christian theologian who says, our modern understanding helps us to understand why the book of Genesis isn't true. It, it doesn't, well, it's true, but you have to understand it in a different way. It doesn't really mean what the words say on the surface. One of the arguments that's made, for example, about the book of Genesis, they would say chapters 1 to 11, it, it wasn't something that was really recorded and known by Moses and even handed down to him uh, from prior times. It was something that was uh, uh, concocted during the time that the Jews were in the captivity in Babylon after 586 B.C., and the Jews came back from captivity with uh, a, a, a changed form of Hebrew writing, which had the more the square type of characters rather than the rounded characters. But also, they must have gotten this story of the creation that's in the, in the book of Genesis. They must have gotten it from the, uh, the stories that were being told in the Near East. For example, the Enuma Elish. So some of these modernists might say the Enuma Elish would be, for example, even a source for the story, the, the, what they would call a creation account, a creation story of the Bible. Well, but our point of view would be, no, Moses had it right. It was given by God, and it's correct and it's accurate. And the Jews who were taken uh, captivity by that time, they were idolaters so much to the point that was why God abandoned them to captivity uh, for the northern tribes for millennia, <coughs> for the tribe of Judah and the, the kingdom of Judah for at least 70 years in Babylon because they had sunk into a very severe uh, idolatry. So there's a lot of storytelling. Just what uh, Dr. Jang was talking about. Uh, when you abandon creation, you, you tell all kinds of stories, all kinds of superstitions. So let's just look at the timeline on that. The modernists would say, well, Genesis chapters 1 to 11, it was probably concocted during the time the Jews... Oh, thank you. Does this work? Uh, oh, it doesn't have... No batteries. It's going to work, right? Thank you. Old good. The old style, yeah. Like a, like a car with manual door locks. It's good. It always works. <coughs> Uh, so they would say that during this time, uh, this was the time when this story of Genesis chapters 1 to 11 was concocted. Uh, this six-day creation and the fall of man and the flood and all of those things. Uh, well, there's some major problems with that. I want to look at other evidences, and you'll find a lot of these come from China. So here's the time frame. But the Bible as we know it, what at least was written and delivered by Moses at this time, they probably had other sources for it uh, before that. So the people who say, well, this isn't true, first they say, they, they, this, is not, this, this is the one that's not true, uh, uh, and so they would accept this. What about all of these other things? Let me talk about one that's not from China, and that's what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. You know, the Samaritans are, if you've been studying the Bible, they're the ones that were looked down on by the Jews, right? They were the ones who were kind of the half-breeds, the, one the ones who were brought in from other areas when the northern tribes of Israel were taken away by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. But when these foreigners were brought into the land, they were attacked by wild animals. They were afraid. They said, we don't know... We're very fearful of the gods of this land. Send us back some of the Jewish teachers to teach us how to fear and honor 
the God of this land. So some Jewish teachers were sent back from Babylon. Uh, no, I'm from, from Assyria, from, from uh, well, today <laughs> it's, it's Mosul. At that time it was Nineveh, uh, to teach um, uh, how to honor the God of the land. So <coughs> those northern tribes, that whole area was, was mixed. That's why the Samaritans were looked down upon. What's not commonly known is that uh, many of those uh, who returned, they maintained virtually all of the Old Testament Pentateuch. Pentateuch means uh, the five, first five books of the Bible, which is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, with a few minor changes. For example, uh, in, instead of uh, um, the mountain of Jerusalem, it might mention Mount Gerizim, which is next to Shechem. So a few changes here and there that would be it would tell the story better from the Samaritan point of view. But the rest of it, the text is identical. And if you look at, for example, the account, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, in the Ten Commandments, where the Lord said, in six days God hath created heaven and earth. If you compare that with the Samaritan Pentateuch and with the, with the Hebrew Pentateuch, uh, for example, in the, in the Masoretic text, it's identical, the same character for character. I hope this isn't too boring. It's, it's really interesting because character for character, but what kind of character? The Samaritan Pentateuch was and still is recorded in the ancient, rounded Hebrew characters that were in use before 722 BC when the northern tribes were taken away, before 586 when the Jews went into, uh, from, from the south were taken in, into Babylon. That's important because the people who would say, oh, all this was created in Babylon, and when it, and it came back, it was written in the, Hebrew, in the squared Hebrew characters. It's interesting that the despised Samaritans are in part rescuing the Hebrew scriptures because they affirm the Hebrew scriptures. And we know because the Samaritans would never copy those square characters because of the disdain of the Jews and the Samaritans this way and that way. So they retained the, the round but it tells the same story, character for character for character. I've checked some of these on the internet. Uh, if you check on the internet, you, you, you will not see, for example, uh, the rounded characters on the internet versus the square characters, uh, because there's no font for the old rounded characters. But, it's, but character for character is the same. So it says, so the Samaritan Pentateuch shows very clearly that was not made up at the time that the Jews were in captivity in Babylon. It preceded that. So it's just nonsense. It's made up stuff. Okay? Now, to China. The Chinese border sacrifice goes back to the very beginning of Chinese society, of Chinese culture, uh, in the time of Abraham or prior, 4,000 years or more ago. Okay? And the Board of Sacrifice uh, invo involves a recitation that honors God specifically, one specific creator God. And if you look at the Chinese classics, uh, not the Board of uh, Sacrifice recitation, but the classics, you find that the, uh, the characteristics uh, of the one singular creator God worshipped by the ancient Chinese was exactly identical in attributes to the God of the Bible. They weren't worshiping a different God. Shangdi, Yehohua, the same God, the, ancient, the, the God of ancient China, the same God. And the guy who talked about this last year, C.K. Tong, uh, he gave this lecture, some of this I've gotten from him, and if someone wants to see, uh, his lectures are on our website. If you have the yellow piece of paper, his lectures from last year, he said, you know, I was fourth generation to Singapore, but my, you know, fourth, fourth generation, my family came from Guangzhou, and uh, when I became a Christian, when I was in the military, I was really embarrassed because I thought, to become a Christian, I'm giving up my Chinese roots. I, I'm, I feel like I'm not Chinese anymore. He said, until he, he, he took a job um, in, in Tianjin and moved to Beijing, and he looked and he realized, he started researching. He didn't even want to go to the Temple of Heaven. He thought, oh, that's all that uh, Chinese to old stuff. Until he realized, he started comparing and found that the God that was worshipped in ancient China was exactly the same as the God of the Bible in attributes, in character, in creation. And so this uh, border sacrifice recitation includes words 
that really describe the creation in words that are very, very similar to the description of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And there's a singular creator God. And, uh, uh, and then what I don't have in here is the, is the fact that the, um, that the Chinese classics really identify um, God is the same as, as the God of the Bible in attributes. That is affirming, that is, it corroborate, corroborates. The word corroboration means it's saying the same thing. Agreement, like the two witnesses to say the same thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, um, the sacred tree of San Xingue. Uh, how many of you have heard of the San Xingue tree? If you're from China, you've probably heard of San Xingue, but maybe you don't know what's there. It's in Sichuan province, north of Chengdu, maybe 45 minutes, uh, maybe... Uh, a third of the way from, from Chengdu to Mianyang, up that way. So uh, it's amazing you if when you go back to China, go to get a flight to Chengdu, get a driver to take you up to Sanqing Dui, and look, it'll be worth your time. You'll love it because it's important to know it really affirms the Bible record. We'll do that, okay? But what it shows, it's an artist's an artist, an artisan, a craftsman crafting in bronze. A, a, a tree, four meters tall, 3.96 meters high, it's almost 13 feet, so half again as high as this ceiling, depicting or showing the temptation of Eve by Satan in the Garden of Eden. Stunning, but it's really undeniable. You can't deny it, it just seems to tell the story of the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. It's marvelous. And it was only uncovered. It was excavated in 1986. So by August of this year, it will be, it will have seen the light of day for 30 years, I guess. But the Chinese government doesn't advertise that. It's called the sacred tree. They'll recognize it as a holy tree, a relic. But anything, if you go to the museum and look at it, uh, they won't just, they won't mention the, the, the book of uh, of Genesis and and the, and the story of the fall of man. We'll do that. Uh, Chinese character writing. Now, most of you may have. How many of you have some awareness that uh, many of the uh, things in Genesis chapters one through eleven, creation, the fall of man, the great flood, are, are seem to have uh, origin. Uh, oh, the, the Chinese characters seem to have origin in the reality of those stories of the creation, the fall of man, the flood. Have, have, how many of you know this? Have you seen it? Say yes or yes. No. Okay, just a quick one. Uh, we'll see it. If if you go to Beijing at the airport and you see the, the luggage conveyor around that says, "Don't climb on the luggage conveyor," it tells the kids, "Don't climb up on this thing." What's the character that says, "Forbidden, don't do this"? What's it look like? Two trees. Something that means forbidden, don't do this. We'll look at it. Okay. Yeah, you'll find it. Okay. And it's probably the same in traditional Chinese as in the, in the simplified now, I think. It's probably not much different, I don't know. But um, the, the oracle bones, is, a lot of these things were, were written in the very ancient characters on bone, not on parchment, not on something that breaks down over time, but on bone and then later in bronzeware, inscribed in bronze. So the characters going back three, 4,000 years uh, are known and the oldest, uh, in the original, they really show very amazing knowledge of the events of the Genesis chapters 1 through 11. The creation, the fall of man, and the great flood. Some of those characters have changed somewhat over time, so you can maybe see hints of it now, and some of them are still pretty clear. And one thing that's not in China, also, a temptation seal uh, shows uh, in clay the temptation of Eve uh, Acadia would be uh, uh, Sumeria, uh, the Tigris-Euphrates area, about 4,000 years ago. Also, same thing. Okay, let's just go on. So uh, what I want to say there is, this whole picture is to show that this story, that people say, oh, uh, the Bible's not true, the Jews just made up that stuff while they were captives in Babylon and brought it back to Israel when they came back to Israel. It doesn't hold water. It's indefensible. 
when you look at all of the other evidence, it says the same thing, that the story as written by Moses was not just a story. It was history. It was, it was a story of history. It was accurate. Okay, let's, uh, let's go. Okay, so here's the topic. So first I want to talk about China's Genesis witness, number one, the creation. So I want to talk about the creation, the fall, and the, and the flood. Okay, creation. What about this character? I'm taking someone else's word for this, but if you combine a character, this would be a man or a mouth, I guess, uh, or maybe like a gate man. I don't know which one. It would uh, be like a gate or like a mouth or coal. Or per, it's kind of the same thing. I don't know. The dust. This is dust. Maybe this is a tin, and maybe this is the ground. Maybe the idea of dust would be ten toes in the ground. I don't know. You can tell me about this. Okay. And you too, right? You too, right? Uh, and something's living, well, then this is like to talk, and if you walk, then this gives you create. And so just what the Hebrew has as Adam being the dust man, it's also the same in Chinese, that this Adam it really coming from, being made from dust. Okay? What about, uh, maybe you see this often Chinese New Year? The idea of happiness or blessing, God plus one man in the garden, is happiness or blessing? Okay, now I'm going to talk about, there are many, many more. There are books on this. You can find them. They're easily accessible. Uh, Ethel Nelson, C.K. Tong, who was here last year, uh, has a book called uh, Faith, Faith of Our Fathers, who, and he also discusses a lot of this. They're wonderful resources. And uh, when you want to discuss apologetics, the record of the Chinese history really needs to be incorporated. So you folks from China, you, you, the nice couple here in the front and a friend back there, and China has some of the greatest witness of the truth of the Bible any place on earth, any place on earth. It's, 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 in, it's within the borders of China. Yeah. Um, so. What I want to say, the, the God of ancient China, Shangdi, is identical to attributes of the God of the Bible. Some might say Yahweh, Chinese Yahua. Uh, so they weren't worshiping a different God. I'll just look at a quick summary of these. Okay? The natural attributes of God as found in the Chinese classics, the classic writings. Okay? He's sovereign. Eternal, immutable, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, infinite. These are God's attributes, and then uh, these are the attributes that he would share with man, his moral attributes. He's love, holy, gracious, faithful. All of these are described, you can find these in the Chinese classics. Why don't most people, Chinese people know this today? Chinese people don't read the Chinese classics today, right? We can find all of these characteristics to find that ancient Chinese recognized the one God with these characteristics. One thing's not mentioned here yet, and that is creator, right? Well, there's more, because with the Boris sacrifice, the recitation that was performed by the emperor, if you read the recitation by the emperors, and those, the Boris sacrifice continued from probably 4,000 years ago until 1911, by 1911, that was when the modern Republic of China was formed under uh, President Sun. And so the Boris sacrifice was discontinued. Although some say secretly, Mao Zedong did it one time, but didn't want anyone to know about it. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, well, well, well known secretly. But so uh, is recognized in language very similar to, to, to Genesis. First of all, uh, both in the, uh, the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvest, that's the most, it's the largest building in, in Temple of Heaven area of Beijing. You find this tablet, and you find the words in Manchurian, and you find the words in Chinese. Um, students don't learn the Manchurian in China anymore, maybe after the after revolution, but so, so at least these. Who is being honored there? Huang Tian Shang Di, the Supreme Lord in the highest heaven. Ancient Chinese didn't worship a multitude of gods. All the stuff about Buddhism and Taoism and it came much, much later in Chinese history. 
and this tablet is in the in the large building, the altar of, in, in the prayer for good harvest, and a similar tablet also in the other, which is the uh, the place where the emperor would uh, would go for the cleansing before they do the sacrifice. So in both buildings, um, and it's there today. I, I took this picture two months ago. Okay, so here's the the, so the ancient border sacrifice recitation by Huangdi describes the creation in words very similar to Genesis and identifies Tian or Changdi as creator. Today people think, oh, Tian, that means, did I say it correctly? Tian or Tian? Tian. 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 Chinese is a tonal language. So Tian or Tian, Tian, different. So today, often Chinese think, oh, Tian is like just the sky or heaven, not, not a being. But ancient Chinese recognized Tian, used the word to mean a being. For example, a being who could be angry, uh, uh, could have feelings. So it was, it was and, and, and the ancient scholars in the classics said, China does not have two gods. The ancients don't have two gods. There's only one god, Tian Shangdi. One and the same God, you recognize. So here's the recitation. Um, okay, well, here's the English translation, okay? Of old in the beginning there was the great chaos without form and dark. The five planets had not begun to revolve nor the two lights to shine. In the midst of it there existed neither form nor sound. You, O sovereign, O spiritual sovereign, and by the way, in the Chinese, if you find it, I think this is the diminutive you, you meaning the person speaking is much lower than the one being spoken to. Spiritual sovereign came forth in your sovereignty and first did separate the impure from the pure. You made heaven, you made earth, you made man. All things became alive with reproducing power. This is a paraphrase, if you wanted to take it as a paraphrase, of the story of creation in the book of Genesis chapter 1. As God made different things says, to reproduce after their own kind beginning with chaos. And all that was done by one sovereign, not a multitude of gods fighting against each other. This is the god of ancient China. Okay. So, why do I say this? Because this is, again, it's corroboration. It's another witness that the ancients across the world knew the same thing as is recorded in the book of Genesis. It's the same story. It's not a different story. The book of Genesis is not a story made up by some Johnny-come-lately or something. It was known and understood by the ancients. They're telling the same story. Okay? So here it is. On that list of attributes, we had uh, gracious and so on. Now we add creator. Because as the recitation, said, you made heaven, you made earth, you made man. All things came alive with reproducing power. The point, the God that was recognized and worshipped by ancient Chinese is identical to Yahweh, or Yehovah, of the Bible. They all knew the same story. And the creation recitation affirms individual reproducing life types and agrees with Genesis. And contra contravenes means says the opposite from Darwinism's tree of life story. If you don't know what the tree of life story was, Alan Jang showed the picture of the tree of life story. It's the fairy tale that can be taught in school. The idea that from one organism came two or three and then came more and more and more. That's not scientific. It's been even on the I think it was Science Magazine several years ago or Science Journal said the, the, the tree of life story has really been found to be non-scientific, but it's still taught. And Al can probably, can probably tell you many schools or textbooks where it's being taught. But this con contravenes Darwinism's tree of life story that all things came alive with reproducing power. That is, apple trees have apples with seeds in them. The apple falls to the ground, the, and the seed's going to give another apple tree. And that's what we see today, by the way, isn't it? You think things are kind of strange if, 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 you, if you have two dogs, you want to uh, have some puppies or something, and out come cats. For me, I'd be very disappointed. My wife would be happy. <laughs> I prefer not to, to have the cats. Okay, so now, that's the creation. What about the fall of man? What do I mean by the fall? 
we talked about it in the earlier session, the fall of man was the temptation by Eve and then Adam to eat the forbidden fruit, which brought the consequence of, of, of death with the associated pain and suffering, what Tennyson called uh, nature red in bloody tooth and claw, all the suffering that happens in the world. Uh, so uh, what, does, what do we find in China that might describe this? Uh, well, here's some characters. First of all, um, remember that in the, um, in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. One was the tree of life, one was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll find this in quite a few Chinese characters. Just look, let's just look at one. How about this one? Forbidden. Man was forbidden to eat from one of the two trees, and if he ate the forbidden tree from, from, from this one, he would, the other one would be taken from him also. Two, tree, two trees and a command is forbidden. Where'd that come from? That's interesting. You find this all over China. You might even find it on the, uh, on the baggage conveyor at Beijing International Airport. There it is. Don't climb up on the baggage conveyor. <laughs> all of the, I, pic, I, I got tired of taking pictures around China with that character. The only one I didn't get that I still wanted to get was the one you drive along, there's a sign showing someone driving along the car, throwing a piece of paper out the window. You got, it, there's the character on, this, on the sign at the side of the road, it means don't litter, right? I, but I couldn't get my camera out in time to take the picture as we were zooming along the road. So here's another. We go two trees plus a woman is to covet or to desire. Now, I mean, as a man might say, well, I understand a woman and covet and desire, or a woman might say, I understand if I look at a man, that's covet and desire, but, but two trees? That's kind of interesting. And so, again, this appears to have the same origin, these very ancient Chinese characters found on the oracle bones and the bronzeware uh, that, that uh, tell the same story as the Bible coming from a parallel source, independent, telling the same story. Okay, uh, Okay. what about this one? It's kind of interesting. Life or motion, you, use this character. you guys can tell this better than I do. Sometimes you have these extra strokes that add a certain meaning, something that's living, something secret or private. In a garden, there's the garden, as the Bible describes, where Adam and Eve were, plus man, you put them together, and there's uh, Mokwe. Is this Mokwe? Is it a character? Is it a, a Kwe? Kwe? Just a, a, like a demon or evil spirit. This is the Satan. Uh, it's interesting. You have a, a garden. You put a man there, and it's something secret, and it's something living. Then you have the, the devil or Satan. And here's the devil. But then you combine the devil with two trees. Then you get the, the tempter. So... So, but the point is that these really come from the characters that go back 4,000 years, a long time, okay? What about, how would you describe naked? Oh, I don't have any clothes on. How do I say that? Oh, it's a man plus fruit. Huh? Mm -hmm. A man plus fruit is naked, but we understand that when they ate the, from the tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they realized they didn't have clothes. I understand why people in in New York City in January, wear heavy coats. But uh, why do people in Hong Kong in August wear any clothing at all? <laughs> There's something we all recognize as something that God has revealed to man. It's something that's very natural, this understanding of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Because we weren't wearing clothes. We were like, the, like all the other critters before the fall of man uh, in that regard, in not having clothing. Okay? Um, there's another one, clothing plus fruit. So there are many of these characters. There are books, and you can read these, uh, uh, and you should. But what about one, this one? There's the character up there. This is the most ancient form for death uh, from the oracle bones, uh, and it's a tree with two hands and uh, two mouths, okay? Uh, 
why would you have a tree with two hands and two mouths to represent death? This is the most ancient form. If somebody can help me. Is, is, is this the modern form here for that? For, for death? We have some people. This one? So this character over time has developed from this most ancient form of the word for death by following all the way back through the oracle bones, the bronzeware, and how the etymology, etymology is not the right word for developing of characters. Uh, philology, I guess, is the word. So, so the modern form has resemblance to the ancient form, which consisted of a tree with two hands, two mouths, and this is in the book by C. K. Tong, Faith of Our Fathers. Okay? And uh, probably other places also. The most stunning uh, evidence to me of the fall of man, the story of uh, Genesis chapter 3, with the temptation of Eve, then Adam, to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, comes from China. It was uncovered, um, it'll be 30 years ago in August. I think it was, it was un uncovered summer of uh, 1986. So we went to look for it. This was two months ago. So we were, this is the place we're looking for, is San Xingui. Okay, hope I pronounced it correctly. I'm not Chinese, but something like that. And on we went, and we found they had known for uh, centuries there, there was a, a, a burial mound here of some kind, and a large uh, brick uh, fence around it. During the Cultural Revolution time and after, a lot of the bricks had been taken away by a brick maker, so a lot of the outside border fence is gone. But the mound was finally excavated uh, 1986, and in that was found this tree that shows the temptation of Adam and Eve. Uh, this is where it was uncovered. Was well, I took this picture because even right here on the post says no, you can't bring any cars or vehicles in. I, I guess that's what does this say? No vehicles? Yeah. So so you can't drive your. There's the character forbidden. So here's the character for forbidden on the post where inside they uncovered the tree that explains the temptation <laughs> and why they have the two trees <laughs> in Chinese writing. So it was buried about 1200 BC. The, the, the narrative around this site and also at the museum where the relics are now stored would say uh, perhaps it was cast. Cast means to, to make this bronze uh, structure maybe 1500 BC, which would be about the time the Jewish people came out from Egypt. So this is a parallel thing. In my view, it's probably preceded 1500 BC uh, for other reasons I can't talk about right now. But so here, here I am with my friend. He's a he's a professor of uh, uh, Zhongyang in, in, in of traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah. He and his wife brought me up from from Chongqing to uh, Sanqing Dui. We're standing right over the burial pit. We're standing on the plexiglass uh, support. Then. Uh, I rubbed away the dust and covered the camera so we could see, look down in the pit, and this is the actual pit where the um, where this tree was excavated. You see the white here, this is the sunshine reflecting off the off the plate. This part you can see through is where I covered the, covered the light so I could get the picture, and that's what it looked like. They put him back in some of the relics, but the other relics are in a museum. And so we go to the museum, there it is. It portrays the temptation and fall, and it's identical to the Genesis 3 account. This sensing to a bronze tree to Christians, we would call it the temptation tree. It's 3.96 meters high. It's about 13, half again as high as this room, excavated in 1986. So the word is it was decommissioned and buried about 1200 BC. Decommissioned means the people who were using that somehow, whether they were worshiping it or using it as a reminder of past history, uh, decommissioning meant, really, that there were some other people coming in that were stronger than they were. So that they didn't have time, they couldn't carry everything with them when they ran. They buried everything, covered it over, and left because someone stronger than they were were coming in and they were going to kill them if they stayed. That's the way it worked, so they buried it. Um, I didn't realize until this time uh, on the road, going from Chengdu up to San Qingdui, uh, it's marvelous, fertile land. Marvelous, fertile land. 
uh, that whole area. You can see why it would be very highly desirable, why people would fight over it. Uh, so, anyway, and also, the, the bronze that was used in making this tree, it's atypical. It means it's not normal. It's not the same as bronzes uh, located for other things of the same era. Let's get a closer look. It has fruit on the branches. Let's just go back. Uh, so you see, here's the tree. We're going to see there's a serpent right here. Here's the serpent's head, his horns, his feet. The serpent's body goes halfway up, and apparently it was broken off because this was excavated in pieces, and they had to put the pieces back together. The serpent's body, part of it's gone. It would have gone to the top. You see the fruit here, and when we get close, we're going to see a woman's hand, and we're going to see a knife in here. So let's first look at the fruit. Here's the fruit. Life-size fruit, very attractive, but surrounded by very sharp, warning knives, like threatening danger to anyone who would come and touch. If you're an artist, if you're an artisan, if you want to represent in bronze the story of danger, a threat, don't touch, don't eat, this is not good, how could you do it better than this? Well, how about the rest? Let's go, to, oh, there's the serpent. Eyes, the mouth. The serpent has horns, by the way. And by the way, something about the serpent that tempted Eve and then Adam. What was unique about the serpent? Maybe after the curse. After the curse, well, God said, you will crawl on your belly all the days of your life. You will eat dust. Meaning that before the fall, besides having no sickness and death for people, serpents had feet. Or at least this one did. And this one has feet. Is depicted precisely the way the scripture just would describe the tempting creature, whatever it was. Uh, there's more. Let's see what else we have here. How many of you have seen any of this? Has anyone ever seen any of this tree? This is the job of Christians and Christian apologists to make sure this stuff is known. And then get your tickets to go to, to, go to Beijing, to go, and, no, to, to, to go to Chengdu, and then go to Sanqingdui and look at it yourself. It's wonderful. Um, you see, the, here's a thumb and a, a, slo, a long, slender fingers. Isn't this the way you would represent a woman's hand? Not a man's hand. Very long, slender fingers. And it's touching the serpent. And very close, hovering near it, is a knife with a blade and a double hilt. So you put a hand to hand. So a knife is something, it's not something that would happen by accident. It's something to be wielded, something to be used. So the picture that you get here is, and if you look at the Bible, what happened first? Did the woman come in contact with the tempter or with the fruit? The tempter first. So the artisan here in producing this showed properly the first problem was coming in contact with Satan, with the tempter, not touching the fruit. Interesting. And the double handle here indicates to be wielded. means if you touch that fruit, there will be a purposeful consequence. The handles mean to be wielded, to be wielded, to be wielded by whom? By God himself, bringing the curse of death on the world. Have you seen this before? Never. It's quite cool. Yeah, that's Strange looking tree. A strange looking tree, yeah. Uh, by the way, it's a very strong, special brass because to support the upper weight, the brass has to, brass, no, brass, bronze, uh, had to be a, a special uh, hardness to be able to support that weight. So I have a friend who is a, a metallurgist at, uh, he was here in the U.S. For, 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 for 20 years. I hope he can find out more about the metallurgy of the bronze in here, especially to see if the source area for the bronze can be identified. I consider it a possibility that maybe this was not cast in China. It may have been carried from another place, even from as far as Acadia. Acadia meaning the Tigris-Euphrates Valley with the scattering after the, uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the languages caused people to be, to be scattered. It may have been carried, and it may be that a metallurgical study would show 
impurities that would be characteristic of, things, of, of the bronzes that could be made in Sumeria, that is in the Tigris-Euphrates area, rather than in China. Interesting research project, um, but if you like science, well, that's good. So we've already done this one. So now let's talk about the flood. First, um, a small boat. Uh, this character, in, in the old form of this, and maybe someone, or enough Chinese here you can help me, I think like a sampan, Americans would, would know that like a sampan is those little boats that the fishermen use and maybe has a little hut and a couple windows in the side and a curve like this and maybe just for one guy or a couple people. But if you flip that on its side, uh, and then it, it has evolved into this character. This is really derived from what we would call the sampan. But you combine that with uh, ba and ko, eight persons, and it gives you the character for a big boat. Well, what do we have in the book of Genesis? With the great flood, Noah and his family survived. All other persons on earth died as a result of the flood. And, uh, so, and he had a very big boat. And so the Chinese character for a big boat corresponds closely to the Bible record. Okay? One that really interests me because, see, my professional work was in flood forecasting. Uh, when, I, when I came to the West Coast, uh, I took a job in flood forecasting. And so floods interest me. I'm looking for examples of flood relics. We need to be done in six minutes. Flood remnant structures, in my view, the, these, this great area of Los, L-O-E-S-S, -S, is a particular kind of soil. In Chinese, it's called Huangtu. Uh, it's a yellow soil. But the soil particles are not rounded like sand at the seashore. They're very sharp angles, so you can put them with very sharp corners. You can build homes in caves that don't collapse. And uh, I, 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 it's my belief this would be a result of the Great Flood, not a topic for today, how, but looking for, uh, it, it appears huge volumes of water came off the Tibetan Plateau, uh, cut this river that then goes uh, in, into Myanmar. Uh, the Lantangjiang comes here, becomes the Migong. The Jitajiang becomes the Yangtze River, comes this way. And then the Yellow River, Kwangtze, is here. But here are these huge deposits, mountains of flood cobbles, rounded rocks. When I say mountains, maybe 300 meters, 400 meters high, more than 1,000 feet deep. I didn't have time to see really how high it is. But I first realized this when I went hiking with a friend uh, eight years ago. I said, just at this spot down here, just, just uh, uh, 45 minutes drive from, from Chengdu. We went for a Sunday afternoon. And so this shows where those yellow clays are. No, they're not clays. I said the wrong thing. Uh, they're, uh, I hope I didn't say clear. It's a loose cell. So it comes from the German word that means loose. It's loose because you can't compact it very well. Um, um, so this is what it looks like. From north from Xi'an, this is what that stuff looks like. And it's uh, hundreds and hundreds of meters deep. Okay? And this covers a large area of, of north China. And, for example, uh, because it, it forms, you can make very sharp edges, they won't collapse. Uh, it's very common to have caves. People can actually live in caves. I visited a, a cave church. Okay, they had three caves side side by side. Uh, maybe today girls wouldn't want to marry a guy who, who says, "Come and marry me and come home." My home is in a cave. It's not the most popular thing to do. But this shows the nature of the soils. This is north from Xi'an, around uh, around Tongchuan, uh, um, uh, I guess that area. So. Mm. Oh, interesting. On this mountain was, was, was where the nationalist Chinese, the, the Kuomintang, and the communist army were fighting uh, around Tongchuan. And uh, so both armies, one was on one side of the mountain, one on the other. So very possible in some of these caves, either the armies of, of, uh, of uh, Jiang Jieshi or the armies of Mao Zedong were sleeping in the caves during the fight. Who you knows? Interesting. So. Now, what the great cobbles, round rocks, around the eastern terminus of the Tibetan Plateau. Here it is, uh, a very famous mountain, Jingchengshan, which is known as the birthplace, the mountain birthplace of Taoism. Okay? But I was hiking here, there's a hiking trail, and there's a garbage can. 
uh, with my friends about eight years ago, and I started looking and said, this is all flood deposit, this whole mountain. We walked up, 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 several hundred meters. The same thing. It's a mountain of rounded flood rocks. What produces, I know, I know things that can produce are little piles of rounded rocks, but mountains of rounded rocks take something different. The principle in science is when you have a very large result, you're looking for a very large cause. And so uh, I was aware of this. So this last trip, I, um, a couple of months ago, I said, I need to look for uh, rocks like this, but further north. And so went looking. Um, this is very close to Beichuan, uh, a city that was abandoned because of the uh, earthquake. Um, uh, and I came back here the second day, and I saw, there it is. I found it. This is a, this is a road sign okay, along the freeway. I saw that. The, we found it. It's the same thing. This is uh, about 50 miles to the north of the other one I showed you. Look a bit uh, closer. Um, the same thing. It's a mountain all the way up. Flood cobbles. Clear to the top of the mountain. What produces mountains of flood cobbles? Something like the, f the flood, the size of the flood in the Bible can do that. Otherwise, there's nothing that we see today that could do anything like this. <coughs> Looking look a little bit closer, uh, this is, there's the freeway light post. You can see a little bit more of the fine detail. I couldn't get too close because I was a couple of lanes of traffic away. I was taking a picture with my telephoto. Okay. But then back to uh, just south of Chengdu, I went look on the other side of the mountain where I saw the hiking trail and found more. Here are these mountains, the same thing all the way to the top. That looks like stone. These are basically rounded rocks cemented together. And here's a closer look with my telephoto. You see all the fine structure. This was taken from about a quarter mile away from it. You see all the fine structures. This is not solid rock. These are little round rocks cemented together by, by heat and pressure to make the mountain. And here's some of the finer structure at, at the lower end. And even a very famous place, uh, Du Changyan. You've heard of Du Changyan? Du Changyan, Du Changyan. Famous hydraulic control structure. Can't talk about it now. But even here, uh, here's the weir, the control structure. And here's an upturned, these are upturned areas of, these are all flood cobbles also. So the flood cobbles had to be cemented with heat and pressure, then something later tipped them up. What produced these in the first place? So, uh, and this is the control stuff, the control structure at, at the Yuzhang Yin. So it's one of the most famous, what I would consider one of the greatest technological uh, achievements of the ancient world. Uh, okay. Uh, now, there's a, very, there's a guy named Da Yu, very famous in Chinese history. He's a, the guy who was famous in China for controlling the floods uh, 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC. And uh, so the question, some Chinese think, oh, maybe he was not a real guy. Some say, oh, that's confusion with that Christian Western idea of a great flood. Uh, but he was a, indeed a very real person. I could not have gotten to his birthplace except with that great earthquake. This is the abandoned town of Beichuan. Uh, they've abandoned and left it as a museum. They've not tried to rebuild this part. You can see all the damage from the uh, 2008 earthquake. But right, he, right close to here, a road now goes through a tunnel. We could not have gotten to Taoyu's birthplace, but with a lot of the construction funds to bring money back into the region, they built a tunnel. It's nine kilometers long going. So we took the tunnel, drive, 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 nine kilometers. You know, so it took us about 30 minutes, and we got to use birthplace. So they put a statue here. Uh, actually, the Buddhists put this here because they hope tourists like me will come and look at the statue and give money to the temple. <laughs> so it's actually in the middle of a Buddhist temple. But he's very famous in Chinese history. How did, what happened there? Well, I think it agrees amazingly with the Bible story of the flood. Because, first of all, Yu, he lived about 2000 BC. When was the flood of the Bible? about 2450 BC. Do you know what happened uh, with the fountains of the deep, hot water coming out, uh, and heated water, air, great circulation, carries all of the moisture to the north and to the south, giving great ice deposits in the North Pole at the poles, and those build, 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 build over a period of perhaps as much as uh, 200 years until it finally reaches a point where it starts then uh, the oceans are cooling, 
and you start to finally begin to melt the ice caps. So by perhaps uh, 400 years later, uh, would be about the time that how you could have gotten credit for controlling the floods of China. His father was not so lucky. His father uh, had the job assigned by the king to control the floods. His father had the job for nine years, and then came a really big, great flood, and the king killed his father and said, okay, now the job is yours. Uh, Dayu was a little bit nervous about that, so he wrote in his own records, he said, I went by my own home three times. I didn't dare go in. <laughs> I think because he's thinking, if I go in my house and have a snack or open the fridge and <laughs> get something to drink, whatever, then if a flood comes, the king's going to kill me. He's thinking I'm, he'll think I'm a slacker, right? <laughs> so uh, so it, it really matches. It's about 400 years after the Bible record of the Great Flood, which really matches the hydrology. That is, the whole meteorology, hydrology picture of what would have happened during the flood and the periods of the centuries shortly following after. Uh, so here's just a few. The deep, uh, I would call these flood relics and remnants. Okay? Uh, I took this picture in the Lansangjiang, just uh, downstream from Dachin, known in the West as, uh, in China, Xiangilila, uh, we say Shangri-La, deeply incised canyons, and just near Kunming, stone forest. This, this is all flood remnant. It takes water to wash away uh, and just leave these remnants. Going further to the... Um, to the east, these are mountains around Luoping County, just on the, uh, uh, the uh, eastern border of Yunnan province, the, near the western border of Guizhou province. All these are flood remnant mountains. If you look at them, if you cut through them, the layers are this way, they're not this way. It's not like something's been upturned. She wants us to go. So, uh, so and here's an example of these, uh, of these uh, flood remnant mountains during the rapeseed bloom in Luoping County. It's, Kind of pretty, actually. Here's, here's a picture I took uh, uh, in March, uh, these same mountains. And um, here's flood remnant of uh, Zhang Jiajie. But, and here's the uh, Qianmen Shan, uh, this Heaven Gate Mountain. This is a hydraulic relic. It takes water to wash this hole out through the solid rock. Okay. So, and if you, if you want to climb the steps, it's okay. 999 steps will get you to the top. Joe by Joe Shichir. Joe by Joe Shichir. Is that right? Yeah. That's a lot of steps for me. But you guys. So now, the Yunnan, this back to fossils. If you have, if you're an Allen student, you'll hear about the Cambrian explosion. Exactly the same thing is found in China, in Yunnan province, in, in, and that is fossils that have abrupt appearance. No precursors, means nothing that shows it came from something else. And stasis means it's not changing. And you find that, uh, here's an example. Uh, the, all these fossils, here's Kunming, uh, Chongqing, here's Sichuan province up here. This whole area has these fossils. Uh, Luoping County is uh, right about uh, here near the Guizhou border. And the stone forest I showed you is, is here. Um, and here the fossils are 60 meters deep, this whole area here. Um, so what do you see? Well, in Luoping County, uh, we, I went looking for them. We went looking for them. We found them in a mountain that looked like it. Maybe this was actually a mountain. I don't know for sure. But we went around and came up to the back. But uh, so these are flood remnant mountains. And we went to look for those fossils. Oh, we found the geo park. So I'm climbing up the trail. Here's the view from up above. My friend Mark from Kunming. And you turn around and here's the fossil dig right there. Uh, this is where they had been excavating the fossils. Unfortunately for Yunnan province, they took all the fossils and loaded them in trucks. I think they took them to Sichuan province to, to the museum in, in, in Chengdu uh, to, to be, they have to slice them more and look for the fossils. So there's still a lot of work to do. My favorite selfie, kind of, you know, where's, where, where's Elmo? So you see down below these blood remnant mountains, the rape sea, and all this was the, was the fossil dig where they had excavated the fossils. Well, what did they find? They found Shelly marine fossils without precursors. It means nothing that shows it came from something else. Already everything's fully developed. Already fully developed. Uh, eye structures, limb structures, same thing as Darwin knew in Cambria. Cambria's Wales. And he knew the same kind of thing. With, and Darwin worried about it. He said, well, well, maybe the fossil record will show something better later. And I'll just give one last example because the lady's waiting for us. 
the horseshoe crab. You talk to, him about, uh, to talk to your students about the horseshoe crab, Alan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I discovered you can order a horseshoe crab online if you want a real live one. Because they're really still there today. Uh, but up there, remember I said those, the picture I showed you up there where we went to the fossil dig? This is in Lopeng County, uh, in near Lopeng City, uh, in uh, eastern Yunnan province. There's a horseshoe crab. I didn't put a picture of line here. You didn't have no limulus, Lopengans. They found a horseshoe crab, and they date that. When I say they, people who believe evolution, they say, oh, that would be about uh, more than 200 million years ago. But what this shows is stasis. I've gone here, increasing complexity and time. Evolution would say gradual occurrence and change. If evolution is true, you should find life forms increasing in complexity doing this. Everything we find, abrupt appearance, and stasis stays the same. Either we still see it today, or maybe abrupt appearance, and then there aren't any left today. They're extinct. So here's abrupt appearance, and it disappears, but it's still stasis. Stasis. Uh, uh, Alan talked about the silicon, Latimeria. Same thing going back to maybe 65 million years ago. Still the same today. What does this say? It really says this time scale is wrong. It's based on scientism, it's not based on science. And I think the lady's waiting for us to get out of here, so, oh, I gotta do one more. You seen this place? This is Zhang uh, Jiajie. Uh, no, Zhang Jiajie. I didn't say it right. The highest natural bridge in the world. The separation between these two columns is probably about 70 meters, but from the bottom of the bridge, down to the base is about 355 meters. Highest natural bridge in the world. But the question is, oh, and have you seen, uh, what's the movie, Avatar? Avatar? Avatar, Avatar. Have you seen the movie Avatar? The Hallelujah Mountain is probably right back over back here that a lot of it's based on. It's my, first of all, you look, you look for straight lines. You see the top of these mountains there, there, those back there. It looks like, this is what's left of what was a solid plane. And then, what about the, here's a, here's a straight line. The vertical columns here, it's my belief, actually, that this may be, maybe about the only place on Earth I know of that might be original pre-flood surface. Maybe original pre-flood surface. Because all, all, basically, all of the Earth's surface has been resurfaced by the flood of the Bible. Why? What produces straight columns like this? Maybe very hot water coming out of the earth. And you look for some curves, like you see this cur curve here, and some curves. If you glaze something like a piece of pottery, if you glaze it really tightly, if you get something that's really tight, if you break it, it might break in a curve. And so it appears maybe this was glazed, it, it brought a lot of the material out, and we're working on a project to see what we can do with this. But in, in my view, this is one of the most interesting science research projects dealing with the process by which the flood happened. You can find, we need to stop now. Let me see what else, see if I, oh, <laughs> yeah, my selfie, okay. I didn't take a bit. Uh, my question, standing atop the pre-flood Earth's surface? Maybe, really. So there I am <laughs> in my rain, because when we went there, it was raining. I was standing right there. So. And that's why I went. But the picture here came from a picture book I had to buy because I couldn't see anything. It was raining like crazy when we went out. Okay, thank you all.